Well, good morning, church. The Lord has given us a beautiful day to be out and about. Grateful that we can be. I was thinking earlier, if we were still back in the day when we were doing parking lot worship, this would have been one of those good days to have that. Um, a week ago, not so much. It was in the 90s in September. It's crazy. I've uh, got a friend that works with church in Phoenix area, and they were having a youth rally this weekend, and uh, he mentioned that 120 degrees. And I thought, glad I'm in central Ohio. But glad I'm here this morning with you and uh, to share this time in God's Word together. I've been told that I have a book problem too many books. I tend to disagree with that assessment. I really think what I have is a space problem. <laughs> not enough room for books. And maybe a time problem, not enough time to read the books, but I'm, I'm working on that constantly. One reason that I have a space problem, not a book problem, is that I love devotional literature. And I love... I just love books that help me understand and appreciate better the most important book in my life, God's book, the Bible. And so I spend a lot of time reading devotional type literature that hopefully draws me closer to God and his word. Of course, the best source of devotional literature in the world is the Bible itself. The Bible is not a textbook or a book of laws, as some think. It is rather a book that intends to draw us closer to our Creator. That's what devotional means. I want us to, today to study together one of the great devotional chapters in all of God's Word. We're sharing some lessons from the prophet Isaiah. And, and my prayer is that, that we are drawn closer to God, closer than, to him than, uh, than when we came this morning, by looking at this portion of his word. Isaiah chapter 35. A little background to get started in this. Isaiah is the premier prophet of the Old Testament. Some, some have referred to his book as the Bible in miniature. Um, and it, it is that in a sense because of the way it covers all the important themes of Scripture, all the emphases of Scripture you can find in Isaiah. He is the major predictor in the Old Testament of the coming of the Messiah, of Jesus, the Christ. Uh, in Isaiah, you'll find all kinds of types of, uh, of writing. You'll find messages of, of doom and judgment, as well as sermons of hope and peace. So there's a lot of riches for the believer in this book. You might recall that the, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch that we read about in Acts chapter 8 when he's introduced to us, he was reading from the book of Isaiah as he rode along in a, in a chariot. He was reading from Isaiah, and Luke tells us that God sent Philip to him, and, and that beginning from Isaiah, Philip preached unto him Jesus and eventually gospel obedience. And so you can learn a lot about Jesus from Isaiah. Isaiah is a powerful prophet. Well, Isaiah chapter 35 has a, a wonderful message for all of us today. It's, it's really set in the middle of a dark, depressing part of the book. Uh, chapter 34, for instance, you have messages of doom that God speaks through the prophet to, to people who refuse to acknowledge and obey God. And then if you go to the next chapter after the one we'll read from, chapter 36 and following after that, you have a period of war between the greatly feared Assyrian nation and God's people. 
But right in the middle, you have this powerful message of hope and peace and encouragement. So Isaiah understood that even though the world has some problems, that God was a God of hope. I think we need to remember that today. Times can be dark, but God is the light. So let's read together these uh, wonderful verses from the 35th chapter of Isaiah. There are 10 verses in that chapter. Let's just let's read them and reflect on them for our message today. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there. It shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I want us to look at this text from a few different perspectives today, because I think if we're we're really going to understand and appreciate it as the Word of God, we need to do that. Uh, If we're going to apply it faithfully, we need to look at it from some different angles. And first... uh, we need to understand, as we've already discussed, that this was originally a prophecy given to, to this man Isaiah by God for ancient Israel. Israel was not very many years from being destroyed as a nation by the Assyrians. So the specifics of this time of peace and prosperity that is pictured in Isaiah 35 They never came to fruition for them, for Israel, because they were unfaithful, you see. Now that's much more than just a historical truth. It's a point that we need to apply as we read the promises of the Bible. God makes great promises very often to his people. He makes wonderful promises to those of us who are his children today. We can read and study them throughout Scripture, but folks, they are conditional. We can't expect to enjoy the promises of God if we don't live for Him and serve Him as faithfully as we can. So this was originally promised to to Israel, this wonderful picture that is painted in chapter 35, but they never got to enjoy it. The three other perspectives or or lenses that I want us to view this passage through, I'll I'll sort of name them right now and then we'll work through them as we go through the rest of this. Number two is that Isaiah 35 is a prophecy of Jesus 
as well as a prophecy of ancient Israel. Many of the things that the Lord says, we recognize, uh, many of the things that Isaiah says, we recognize as being fulfilled in the life and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then third, the third angle, is that Isaiah 35 is a prophecy of the church and how it should be. This gives us some insight into how our life in, in the church ought to be. And then finally, Isaiah 35 is ultimately a prophecy of heaven and what it will be like. So really, you can understand this passage through four perspectives. Israel, Jesus, the church, and heaven. Uh, we've, we, we've looked at how it applied to Israel. Let's, let's see how these others work. Isaiah 35 promises God's people change for the better. You know, people are often afraid of change because there's an uncertainty to change. But God promises, uh, in, in this prophecy, he promises change that's for the better. He does it through some really uh, awesome poetic descriptions of what life is like for people without God as compared to how it is when God works in their lives. You know, God is not content for us to live here in this fallen sinful world and eke out a meager spiritual existence. So many people's spiritual lives are like that. They are, they are dry as a desert. They are as barren as a wilderness. They have no real hope, no enthusiasm for the future. They're just sort of plodding along from day to day. That is not God's will for his people. That's not how he wants it to be for you. What he wants is change. He wants revival. He wants rejuvenation. And that's one of the great things this passage describes. Isaiah pictures a wasteland that God transforms into a lush garden. Look at verses 1 and 2. He then pictures a people who are weak and broken that are then strengthened and healed, verses 3 through 6. He then describes a, a desert that becomes an oasis, verses 6 and 7. And he portrays then a wilderness that becomes a highway, verses 8, 9, and 10. Those are all metaphors of change, of renewal, of revival, for the people of God. God is not content for us to stay where we are. He is not a God of the status quo when it comes to our spirits. He is a God that offers a life of spiritual abundance and wants us to experience it. Have you ever experienced the, the spiritual desert? You know what it's like to be dried up in your spirit? Well, maybe that's something you're in the midst of right now. I don't know. All of us probably have gone through it. All of us were in that at one time before we came to God. We were in a spiritual desert. We were without God. We were sun-bleached and completely parched, for all intents and purposes, dead. And then we accepted the offer of living water from Jesus. Just like the Samaritan woman, you remember her in John chapter 4? Jesus had that wonderful conversation with her. And, and he said to her there, those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Then later on in the Gospel of John, 
There's this time when Jesus is at a festival in Jerusalem. He cries out in chapter 7, Out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. And just in case we're, we're wondering what uh, he meant by that, John, the writer, adds this comment. He said, now he said this about the Spirit, which believers in him were to receive, for as yet there was no Spirit. See, Jesus and what he did while on this earth is the fulfillment of so much of this old prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 35. Jesus is the one who offers water for dry spirits. Jesus is the one who gives life to the dead. Jesus, during his earthly ministry, ministered to the weak and to the sick. He restored sight to the blind. He gave hearing to the deaf. He healed people who couldn't walk. He restored speech to those who had lost it. He did all these things in a literal way. But he told his followers that there's going to be even greater things that will happen. Greater things to come. Now, if I'd been standing there, I'd have wondered, what in the world could that be? After seeing these works, you see. But you think it's an amazing thing that someone who was blind can see again? You know what's even more amazing? Jesus can take a person totally separated from God by their sins and restore that relationship. Somebody that, that we think there is no hope. Jesus can fix that thing. You think it'd be awesome to witness a lame person get up and walk? Even more powerful is what God can do with a person that is totally bored by religion, bored by the Bible, bored in church, and he can ignite their spirit and set them on fire for him. I've seen it happen. Jesus certainly did some incredible things in his earthly ministry. But, but you want to know the truth. We get to witness powerful things as well in his kingdom. Maybe we just don't recognize it. How amazing is it to get to see a person dead in sin, raised to new life, when they're baptized into Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful thing to see? Wouldn't you like to see it happen more? Are you praying for it? How incredible is it to see broken relationships and troubled families sometimes put back together for no other reason than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the power it takes to transform old, crotchety, spiritual sourpusses into dynamic Christian servants? That's power. And it can happen. God promised to do that very kind of thing. And one of the places is right here in Isaiah 35. You see, when God is in control, it says there shall appear streams in the desert and blossoms and forests full of trees and dangerous animals that once would harm are made ineffective. That's verse 7. And then he says there's going to be a highway. Now we hear a lot about highways and roads and corridors and we see a lot of repairs. 
I don't know, around here I hear a lot about roundabouts. I hear a lot of complaints about roundabouts. That isn't really what, uh, the, the, that's not really the picture that Isaiah is painting here. What, what Isaiah describes is, is a spiritual desert or, or wilderness in which people are sort of lost. They're wandering around without God. And he says, God is going to build a highway. He's going to build an access road to God, if you will. That's verses 8, 9, and 10 of our text. See, lost people need to find the right road, don't they? So God builds a road to him, and he calls it the holy way. And he does this through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. That's what paves the way to God. And he also does this through the church, which provides a set of fellow travelers on this road to God. We really need both. You know, we, we couldn't get to God without Jesus, and we would surely fall away without the encouragement we receive from brothers and sisters in the church. They're both part of the holy way, aren't they? As God designed it. Jesus said there was a road to God. Remember his great sermon? It's recorded in Matthew chapter 7. He said that there are roads out there to death and destruction that lead to nowhere. But he said there was this narrow road that the righteous travel on to God. And he says, few there are who find it, few there are who travel it. That points out something that's very important about this holy way, God's highway. It is a limited access highway. Only the holy are on it. Isaiah says the unclean are not there. So this is a road for God's people it's a place where danger and death and destruction are not allowed. Of course, we know we can find a lot of that on most highways, but not on God's. I think here's where we start to see a picture of heaven in this passage. A place without pain, without tragedy, without heartache, a place of purity and peace, a place where God's people finally reach that ultimate source of living water that Jesus promised. Uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 17 promises this, uh, describes heaven in these words. It says, For the Lamb is at the center of the throne and will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And then here in verse 10, Isaiah sums it up so beautifully. I don't know about you, but I want to be on that road to that place. Because there's no place like that in, in this world or in the world that, that Satan offers. I want to be with God. Do you want to be with God I want to live as close to him as I can here in this world, and I want to be on this highway, traveling to the place he's promised his people. I want to serve this God that makes streams in the desert and turns dry places into lush gardens. I want to know this God who renews and restores and refreshes souls. I hope you feel the same way. During the construction of the great Hoover Dam, a massive project, of course, but there were at least 87 people who were killed in various accidents while this dam was built. It was dangerous work. If you 
go and visit that site today, you will find displayed in a prominent place a plaque that has the following inscription. For those who died that the desert might bloom. You know where they stole that phrase. There was one who died so that our dry spirits could blossom. Sometimes we sing this song, there was one who was willing to die in my stead so a soul so unworthy might live. And the path to the cross he was willing to tread all the sins of my life to forgive. Of course, that one was Jesus. I just want to ask you today, how are, how are you with him today? If you're not right with him, don't you want some of this living water? Do you want to take advantage of this offer? Jesus offers an oasis. What the world offers you is a mirage. It's your choice. Choose wisely. And if you need to respond to his offer today, we give you this moment to think about it while we stand and sing this song. Thank you.